A warm welcome to Home Nursing Foundation's webinar series on palliative home care for frail elderly. So um, Home Nursing Foundation has been providing home care for 47, uh, 46 years now. And we are increasingly seeing many patients who are nearing the end of life. And many of them have chronic illnesses or um, end-stage renal failure and cardiac failure, which um, I think it is good time that we learn how to manage them properly. I'm very, very grateful to Dr. Ng Wai Chong for helping us to connect with Tan Tock Seng Hospital's Palliative Care Department to bring about this series. And also extremely grateful for Dr. Or to be spending her precious Saturday afternoon to share with us about um, palliative care for advanced cardiac and renal disease. So uh, without further ado, I will uh, hand over the time. Just a quick uh, promotion that uh, we are having a cycling fundraiser. As you know, we are a charity. So many of our patients do have financial difficulties and we uh, have to raise funds to make sure that they are uh, being cared for and we would also be able to uh, provide good care to them. So uh, please sign up if you are a cyclist or uh, donate generously to um, help our patients. Thanks very much. Wai Chong, over to you. Thanks, Christina. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Dr. Ng Wai Chong, the Medical Advisor for Home Nursing Foundation. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce our speaker, Dr. Ao Chia Hui. Dr. Ao is an Associate Consultant in the Department of Palliative and Supportive Care, Woodlands Health. She's also a visiting consultant for HCA Hospice Home Care and joins the team once a week to review patients at home. Her interests are in palliative care in patients with advanced heart failure, as well as in education. So she's an adjunct lecturer with Lee Kong Chien School of Medicine and LKC Posting Lead for Palliative Medicine in Woodlands Health. So, uh, well, can we invite, uh, um, well, we, we can't applause uh, to greet her. So welcome Dr. Ao to share her knowledge with us on the, uh, to, to update us on the latest in palliative care and the essentials in palliative care for people with advanced heart failure as well as renal failure. Yeah, Dr. Ao, please. Thank you, Dr. Tiong and Dr. Ng for the very kind introduction. Uh, it's indeed uh, very privileged to be here and uh, everybody else's time is also just as precious and I really hope that um, I can share my knowledge and experience. I'm no expert, um, but whatever I know in advanced cardiac and renal disease. So without further ado, I'll, I'd like to start off with a case that I just recently, very, very recently saw, in fact, just a few weeks ago. And I, I think this might uh, sound familiar to uh, some of us here who also see frail patients at home. So this is Madam K. She's an 80 years old Chinese lady who's pre-morbid ADL assisted and ambulant with a walking stick, largely homebound. Um, she stays with her husband and she has four daughters who all leaves apart. So on the clinical frailty scale, she's probably about five to six. Um, and she has a past medical history of mild cognitive impairment, not formally diagnosed with dementia. She has known ischemic heart disease with an EF of about 40%. Um, she also has got stage 5 CKD with a baseline creatinine of 300. So her crack clearance is about 13 mils per minute. And she has multiple cardiovascular risk factors as is very familiar to many of our patients uh, with IHD and CKD. So by the time I saw her and she was referred to us, uh, this was her third admission in three months uh, for NSTEMI. And uh, this time round, it was complicated by fluid overload, requiring a uh, diuresis. La. And uh, they tried to give her bolus Lasix, but she couldn't pass adequately. So they had to start her on infusion of Lasix up to 10 milligrams per hour. Um, however, the diuresis was limited by hypotension and rising creatinine function. And her crack began to rise from a baseline of 300s to 500s. And despite that, she still remained fluid overloaded, oxygen dependent on nasal prongs. And she was having persistent angina, uh, increasingly lethargic as the creatinine and urea started to decline and began to develop a delirium. So in the outpatient setting, when she was seeing her renal physician, consistently there has been very, very long discussions about uh, whether to dialyze or not to dialyze. And the patient herself actually expressed multiple times before in the presence of her daughter and her husband that she didn't want to go for dialysis. So this time round, um, cardio and renal were both called in to see her. 
And I think cardio um, said that they were not going to do coronary angiogram or try to put stents or even CABG um, in view of her concomitant renal impairment for which she's already declined dialysis because her risk of developing nephrotoxicity was very high after PCI. And the renal physician came and said that uh, they were not offering dialysis because patient has previously expressed wish not for dialysis. Plus the fact that she has high risk uh, 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 in view of uh, hemodynamic instability and uh, 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 ischemic heart disease with recurrent and STEMI and an ongoing angina. Now, the problem came when one of her daughter, the one who also accompanied her to the clinic, demanded for PCI and dialysis because she said she needed to save my mother's life and to prolong her for as long as you know, she could. And she said that my mom keeps complaining of chest pain. She's also getting more sleepy and confused and you are not doing anything. Right. And she said that um, I, I don't think my mom understood what she meant when she refused dialysis previously. So now I'm insisting that the cardiologist do the PCI. And if she needs dialysis after that, go ahead and do the dialysis. Right. So this is something that you may commonly um, encounter as a conversation at home. And I think I really wanted to just go through the evidence of, you know, what is advanced heart failure? What are the interventions possible? Because we can't really advise our patients if we don't know what's available out there. And what's the current literature or evidence as to whether to offer dialysis in frail, frail elderly patients? I hope I don't overrun. I have a lot of slides, but I'll try my best. <laughs> yeah, so, so this is what we are going to cover. Yeah, I'll, I'll first talk about heart failure and then renal failure. It's in fact a bit arbitrary to try and separate them because we do see them concomitantly in a lot of our patients. But just for sake of uh, uh, clarity, we will just separate them for this lecture. So let's talk about end-stage heart failure first. Um, I think the numbers are quite scary. This was a paper in 2017. And you can see that uh, Singapore is just slightly behind Malaysia in terms of the prevalence of heart failure that's on the right side. Uh, there's no incidence because I don't think Singapore-wise we are collecting that data. Uh, when I tried to look at the the numbers, I couldn't find any as well. And uh, it's scary because um, papers have consistently shown that in Southeast Asia, even though our obesity rates are much lower than the Western countries, for some reason, we have a higher prevalence of heart failure. And our patients tend to present much earlier, all right, which also means that by the time they reach an older age, they're probably in more advanced stages, right? Because now people live longer with better treatment as well. And they tend to end up in ICU more prolonged uh, periods of mechanical ventilation with more severe heart failure symptoms. Okay, So how do we know when a patient is approaching advanced heart failure? Right? So these are some of the features you might see in your patients. So if your patient with known congestive cardiac failure um, starts getting admitted to hospital very frequently, right? so more than two times in the past year, if you notice that other organ impairments are setting in, so worsening renal function, um, sometimes they do get worsening liver function because of hepatic congestion as well. If they are losing weight without a clear cause, right, it could be cardiac cachexia. If you notice that you know their cardiac medicines needs to be taken off because of hypotension, you know, um, or re poor worsening renal function, so they can't tolerate the beta blockers, the ACE inhibitors, the drugs that would really uh, have a mortality benefit. Okay, if they have uh, increasing hypotension worsening symptoms, meaning to say, um, in general, we say it's NYHA class three to four. That means they are either breathless even at rest or with just very minimal exertion, they are breathless. Or American uh, College of Cardiology, stage D, um, basically ju that just means they have some structural heart disease with very refractory symptoms, right? And uh, you need increasing doses of diuretics just to maintain their volume status. So you find yourself increasing the furosemide dose or needing to add on metolazone or switching to other drugs like bumetanide, which we'll talk about later, right? they get um, increasingly hyponatremic. And if they have a defibrillator, the shocks come more and more frequently. So, so these are the features that will alert you that your patient is not doing well and is approaching the advanced stages of heart failure. And the palliative care needs in this population um, really is number one, symptoms, right? Number two is um, what will tell you that they might have some health care needs is if they have progressive physical and cognitive decline. We'll also talk about why they start developing cognitive decline or cardiac cachexia. If they develop concomitant life-limiting condition like cancer, um, advanced cancer or uh, dementia, right? if you know a lot of 
I saw a lot of very early MCR numbers here and <laughs> I think many of us here have very, very, uh, a lot of clinical experience. And if just based on your, your clinical experience and you have this sense that you won't be surprised if the patient died within the next 12 months, actually that's a strong predictor, right? And uh, if there's need for psycho-emotional support or complex communications like grief and bereavement issues, um, a lot of uh, disagreement pertaining to medical treatment or care coordination issues. So what is the role of palliative care? Um, if you look at the blue box on the right side under primary palliative care, I think that's what we all hope to achieve. Um, and that, that's what's one thing that everyone, including you and me, not just the pal care physicians, uh, can do. So control pain and symptoms, right? Assist with goals of care discussion and advanced care planning. Um, psycho-emotional support, right? Care planning, coordination of care and helping to just promote, uh, increase, improve the quality of life for the patient and caregiver. Okay. So one of the biggest questions in end organ failure is always prognostication. And um, one of the most unfortunate answers as well <laughs> is that uh, there is really no, no clear way to prognosticate patients with end organ failure. It's extremely difficult, whether it's heart or renal or liver or lung. And um, uh, with heart failure in general, once your patient is diagnosed with a class four, that means they are breathless even at rest, their one-year mortality is about 40%. So four in 10 uh, will pass away within one year. Okay, if they are class three, it's about 10%. And after a hospitalization for heart failure, um, it's 10% mortality in one month. Okay. Now, there are many, many models out there, um, many, like more, maybe twice or triple of this list. Um, I won't go through all of them because at the end of the day, even some of our heart failure physicians don't really use these models. A lot of them are used in research um, and, and uh, uh, for multiple reasons. Right? One is because they have a lot of data that needs to be input before you can calculate the score. Um, some are very, very specific to a certain setting. So you only use it if the patient is hospitalized for acute decompensated heart failure, et cetera, et cetera. But suffice to know that, um, I, I think we go by this, that if your patient is NYHA class three to four, that should trigger you that um, this patient should, you should really start talking about health care and goals of care discussion. Um, and that uh, in end organ failure, regardless of what the organ is, we really talk more about the patient's needs than the prognosis, right? So management of heart failure, this is the typical um, trajectory that you see. Um, so, so stage A to stage D, where stage A, B, C is early heart failure. Lah. So you see all these drugs, right? Like your ABCs, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, furinolactone, and the latest one being SGLT2, which I, uh, we won't go through. Lah. These have been shown to have mortality benefit, but that's not the main, uh, main, main goal of this session today. And you might see other drugs, you know, like diuretics, ivabradine, uh, which are used in specific scenarios to help with uh, heart rate control, you know, sometimes symptoms. But what I really, really want to talk about today is what happens when your patients begin to fail these therapies, right? Or they don't tolerate these therapies. Then they're really heading down to stage D or NYHA 3 to 4. And we would really then start to need to think about, you know, are these patients suitable for advanced cardiac therapy? Right. And, and apart from advanced cardiac therapy, if they are not suitable candidate, what can we do about the symptoms? Okay. So just very briefly about advanced uh, cardiac therapy. Um, so what is out there currently? I mean, things change very fast in heart failure, uh, but what is currently out there is number one, inotropic support. So it's generally used in patients with acute decompensation who have um, very low output states and poor organ perfusion. Um, it can be temporary support, which is, uh, we, we won't really talk about it because you will probably see it more in hospital where patients go into, uh, um, uh, they have an MI, they go into cardiogenic shock, and then they are put on inotropic support until they reach uh, definitive therapy like implant, uh, device implantation or transplant. But what is more relevant is really long-term therapy, more for palliation of symptoms. So these patients are put on long-term inotropes um, uh, just for symptom relief. Um, it doesn't really improve the mortality rate. In fact, it worsens, it may potentially worsen the mortality rate, right? So it improves quality of life, improves symptoms. Some patients do go from NYHA class four to class three or two after you put on inotropes, um, simply because it just makes the heart pump faster and, and your cardiac output improves. Lah. All right. And uh, it decreases hospitalization. 
So there are two main forms of inotropic support. One is continuous infusion of either dobutamine or dopamine. The problem with this is that it's very, very, very resource intensive. Um, we don't really see it very, very frequently because of how costly and resource intensive it is. So maybe if you, every half a year, maybe one, two patients. Yeah. Um, but it is an option. Um, and it may increase mortality because you're flogging a heart that is very tired, right? So the, 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 they develop arrhythmias and uh, earlier death, in fact. Um, and there's a lot of EOL issue as to when to stop, you know, the infusion. You know, what if the, the, the infusion pump runs into problems and the dopamine suddenly stops at home, then, then what do you do? Right. The other one that you might see some of your patients go back for is intermittent uh, inotropic infusion. Uh, there's a drug called levosimendin. Uh, which is basically an inotropes, right? Which has a very long half life, and it um, basically has a, it improves symptoms for maybe weeks to months, depending from patient to patient. So you might see your patients go to the hospital for infusion every few months, um, and uh, it's very costly. It's a few thousand dollars for one jab, but then they don't have to be hooked on to inotropes, you know, in between the infusions. And in general, um, cardiologists would usually give it two to three times. Um, and, and usually after a while, you know, because the heart is also failing, uh, the response to levosimendin will reduce, right? And, and at some point, uh, it will no longer be something that's available uh, for the patient. So this is inotropic support. The second one is mechanical circulatory support. Again, the short-term one, we won't really talk about it. It's more applicable in the hospital setting, like IABPs and ECMOs. Um, what is out there is in the, long, the long term devices. Um, so, Heart Center has got a, a significant group of patients who already have these devices implanted. So, these are the LVETs, and some of them have the BIVETs, which is the, the left ventricular assistive device and the biventricular assistive device. And then TAH is total artificial heart, which is uh, not really done here. Um, so when I did an elective in heart center, I think the oldest patient that they had implanted was about 70s. I can't remember if it was 70s or 80s. Um, this very feisty ama who <laughs> came in very annoyed that he implanted the LVET, um, even though it really helped her with her symptoms. She was kind of wheelchair bound. So she's not really the most um, independent. Uh, but then she does have quality of life because with the LVET implanted, uh, she could go out for meals with her family, you know, but she just really hated having to be anticoagulated, having to come back for blood tests uh, and things like that. Lah. So basically how the LVET works is that uh, there, is a, there is a little uh, pump here. So it draws blood from the left ventricle. Oh, sorry, I just realized you can't see my arrow. Let me just draw. Okay, so there's this little um, pump here that draws blood from the left ventricle and it basically um, pumps the blood into the aorta. Right? So it kind of replaces the function of the heart um, and it, it's a continuous pumping. So patients need to be on anticoagulation uh, to, to ensure that clots don't form. Right? And then there's this device that's tunneled under the skin and exits uh, somewhere in the epigastrium and uh, it's uh, connected to this little battery here that patients carry around. Yeah, so this is how small the battery is. It's really palm-sized. And uh, you may not even notice some of the patients being on it out in the community. Lah. Yeah, so it's quite amazing. Um, of course, if the patients are really homebound and really very frail, like CSF, CFS 7 to 8, then they're probably not candidates. But 5 to 6 may still have room to discuss with the heart failure specialist. And uh, of course, the other, um, yeah, so, so LVETs really improve survival, improve function. So patients do survive beyond two to three years more than what they would. Um, improves function significantly. So I've seen patients with class four going back to class one to two after this LVET. Um, but then there is higher stroke of uh, bleeding and uh, higher risk of bleeding and stroke because of the anticoagulation and how it changes the hemodynamics of the heart. Now, the last advanced cardiac therapy we haven't spoken about is cardiac transplant, but I'm skipping it because I think for most homebound frail elderly, uh, they, they would not really be candidate for cardiac transplant. The next part of end-stage heart failure management is device management. So you may have some patients on pacemakers, uh, defibrillators. And what is important to know is that um, in general, um, all these devices have a pacemaker function. Right? And the pacemaker function is the function that we do not uh, deactivate at the end of life. Uh, because when you pace the heart, you actually provide some symptom relief by maintaining a good cardiac output, preventing fluid overload. 
Uh, what we do want to deactivate is the defibrillator function um, uh, as the patient enters the advanced stages of heart failure, um, especially at the, at the very end of life. So if you do have to talk about deactivation, it's a very sensitive topic because um, patients have been told by their cardiologists maybe for the last five, 10 years of their life that this device is what will keep you alive. And then suddenly we have to come in and talk to them about deactivating it. But if you do have to talk to them about it, um, is to reassure that you know deactivating the defibrillator part does not hasten death, right? In fact, the defibrillator doesn't contribute to quality of life, right? And if the heart is really failing, um, the shocks would not uh, really prevent uh, or, or, or prevent death or prolong survival in that sense, like, because it, the heart is already failing. Okay, so in the home setting, then sometimes what you can do is if there's an agreement to off the defibrillator function, you can just call the vendor into the house and they will come in uh, with the doctor present to just turn off the defibrillator. Okay, so there's no clear guidelines on when we should deactivate defibrillators. Generally, we discuss if the death is very imminent, right? Prognosis is days to weeks or short months. And once you have established a do not resuscitate order. Okay, so again, um, if your patients are not suitable for advanced cardiac therapy, you know that they're clearly very frail, chair to bed bound, uh, very severe cognitive impairment, multiple comorbidities, um, then con con concurrently, um, we also do need to manage their symptom burden, right? And at, with advanced heart failure, apart from physical symptoms, they also have a lot of psychosocial, spiritual and caregiver financial burden. In fact, it's really comparable to advanced cancer, no less, maybe even worse, right? And uh, why do they get the symptoms? What symptoms do they get and why do they get the symptoms they do? Right. So this is a colourful picture that I came up with myself. Um, so in general, when a patient has cardiac dysfunction, um, there is neuro neurohormonal activation and a lot of hemodynamic changes, right? So there's poor cardiac output, there's hypotension, and really what it ends up with is high organ hypoperfusion. Sorry. Okay, so when you hypoperfuse the kidneys, you activate your renal aldosterone angiotensin system, right? So what this results in is basically uh, water and sodium retention. So your patients get congested, they get fluid overloaded, they develop breathlessness and edema. Okay, when there's hypoperfusion to the gut, there is malabsorption of uh, albumin and iron and all the other important nutrients. So your patient starts losing weight. They get hypoalbuminemia, which further contributes to edema. They get uh, anemia, right, which further worsens breathlessness and have poor effort tolerance. And, um, um, and because of all the edema, they also get gut edema. Right? And gut edema itself causes a lot of nausea, vomiting, constipation, anorexia, and cachexia. When there's hypoperfusion to muscles, it causes sarcopenia and weakness. So there's a lot of fatigue and poor effort tolerance. Uh, hypoperfusion to the brain, they get poor memory, they sometimes develop uh, confusion. So you do notice a lot of our frail patients, they may not necessarily be diagnosed with dementia, but the family will tell you that, yeah, 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 the memory, you know, on and off, not so good in the last weeks or months. Okay. Um, and uh, they can get some sleep disorder um, and sensitization to pain. Sorry, somebody's pressing the doorbell. Okay, no, man. somebody's out to rescue her. Okay. So, um, yeah, so, so what happens is then they get anxiety, depression, and poor memory. Okay, and of course, hypoperfusion back to the heart itself, they get arrhythmias, they get cardiac ischemia, which is what we know as angina, right? And all these symptoms that we just spoke about, edema, breathlessness, nausea, vomiting, anxiety, um, what they contribute to is really a, a very strong sense of fatigue. Right. A lot of our patients will tell them, just too tired. Right, They fall asleep when they're sitting in the chair. And you know, we always say, right, try to keep them awake in the daytime. But really, how to, when, when you are so tired and you are too breathless to do anything and you can only sit in the chair, I think it's a very natural thing to fall asleep. Lah, right? and, um, and what happens then is because of poor effort tolerance and fatigue, they become very socially isolated. Right? They can't do what they used to do. There is a very, very deep sense of loneliness, okay? And then they become more and more dependent on their caregiver for a lot of needs, right? Toileting, feeding, and then when the memory gets impaired, there's depression, there's anxiety, all these piles on the caregiver, 
right? And, and the more the caregiver is needed, the less the caregiver is able to leave the house for some respite. Right? So you really see this vicious cycle where, you know, the symptoms just go in, in circles, lah, right? Okay. And, and therefore, what we really want to do is to try to manage these symptoms um, and then take care of the caregiver at the same time to try and break the cycle. Okay. So we'll talk a little bit more about symptoms in heart failure. There's dyspnea. Uh, very, very common in class 3 and 4 patients, I mean NYHA. Um, there, there, there are two um, main types of dyspnea that we want to distinguish uh, in the history, uh, when we take the history of dyspnea. One is continuous dyspnea, so dyspnea at base 9, and one is episodic dyspnea. And it matters because you want to know how to, how to um, uh, manage the non-farm and the pharmacological aspects, right? How to modify activity, uh, how to modify the home, how to prescribe your opioids to manage both continuous and episodic dyspnea. So, so there are multiple different types of episodic dyspnea. Um, it can, dyspnea can be triggered and predictable, right? So I know exactly when I'm going to get breathless. For example, if I go to the toilet, okay, the breathlessness will sure come. Uh, and it's always 6 out of 10 or 7 out of 10. Then there's triggered and unpredictable. So for example, uh, a bout of coughing. So I know coughing triggers dyspnea, but I cannot predict when I'm going to start coughing. And how severe the breathlessness is depends on how severe the bout of coughing is. Okay, Some of it is non-triggered and comes in like an attack. So they cannot predict, they cannot control. It, it comes, it hits them like a wave and before they know it, it's gone. Okay, and some of it is non-triggered, wave-like, so they can feel it coming. There's no trigger, they, they can be sitting in a chair, but then they can tell you that, you know, I can feel the breathlessness coming, it doesn't feel good. Uh, I, I know it's going to last like 20, 30 minutes or even less, right? And then it abates slowly. So how this matters is that when you prescribe opioids, um, and we'll talk about prescription of opioids later, um, but when you prescribe opioids, we always prescribe a baseline dose of opioid to help with the continuous breathlessness, right? And then we add on breakthrough opioids. So if you know that the patient has a triggered and predictable dyspnea, like toileting, then we would say use the breakthrough opioid half an hour before you go to the toilet. That's because that's the duration that it will take for the opioid to work. If it's um, triggered but unpredictable, then of course that's a bit harder because you can't preemptively dose, right? Um, so it's either it's a very short bout of coughing and then they just catch up with oxygen and rest or if it's very prolonged, then they can take the morphine and wait for it to work. Right? The non-triggered attack like is, is extremely difficult to manage because you don't know when to dose the morphine and by the time you take the opioid, the, the attack is over Right? by the time the opioid works. So this one is very hard to manage and sometimes we really need to do more non-farm psychological interventions. Right. And then the wave like one, you can take it when the wave starts and hopefully by the peak of the wave, the opioid would have started to work. Okay. So non-farm management of dyspnea, this one is scoped from the COPD population. Uh, what you will notice about a lot of things in heart failure and renal failure is that there is no, there's no, um, there's, there's a lack of evidence lah, or, or lack of studies uh, that really talks about what drugs work for symptoms. And so a lot of these are taken from the COPD and advanced cancer population. And this is one of them, the breathing thinking functioning model from a UK group. So, um, so in terms of breathing, you want to try to reduce their work and effort of breathing by teaching breathing techniques and positions. So I think if you have uh, PTs, OTs who can go into the house to teach some breathing techniques, that would be helpful. Um, if they're hypoxic, uh, whether on exertion or at rest, oxygen is proven to help. And then a fan blowing to the side of the face also reduces the perception of dyspnea uh, by stimulation of the trigeminal nerve. The thinking model is basically uh, implementing cognitive and psychological strategies. So, um, you know, for these, uh, sometimes our occupational therapies or our social workers can help. Um, a lot of times they, they have learned experience with dyspnea. So they know that when the breathlessness comes, they associate it with, it with death and dying um, or very um, uh, maladaptive thoughts. Lah. And we want to try to correct that because that drives anxiety and worsens the dyspnea. And the last one is functioning. So how do we reduce physical exertion through environmental modification, provision of walking aids uh, and, and things like that. Okay. So again, the, the evidence for opioid use in dyspnea in heart failure is very mixed. 
uh, some very, very small studies do show that uh, oral morphine relieves breathlessness. But when they tried to do larger RCTs, uh, they either couldn't recruit or they managed to recruit, but not enough to numbers uh, to, to power the study. And uh, there was a study that was a randomized crossover trial by Oxbury. I think this one was 30 plus patients, the third one, um, which showed no difference between morphine, oxenome, and placebo. But this study was also underpowered. So again, because of the lack of evidence in heart failure, we take it from the COPD and advanced cancer population, where there have been many, many studies um, proving that morphine is safe and efficacious. And by postulation, we believe that um, it should work the same way, like, whether it's COPD or heart failure. Right. So in the COPD advanced cancer population, the recommendation is to start at about 10 milligrams every 24 hours. Um, in the Western population, they always start the sustained release one. But I think uh, we may not be as, uh, I think at least in the community-wise, you may not be as uh, familiar with a uh, morphine sulfate tablet and they may not be as accessible. So you can always start morphine sulfate syrup. Uh, and uh, the usual recommended dose is 2.5 milligrams, four to six hourly. But again, we do remember that a lot of heart failure patients have concomitant liver or renal impairment. And so if the crack clearance is um, less than 30, right, or the ALT EST is more than three times upper limit of normal, then you can actually uh, reduce the frequency to 2.5 milligrams, uh, six to eight hourly instead. Okay, and the maximum dose that people have um, tried is about 30 milligrams every 24 hours per day. Lah, right? um, and it's still proven to be safe and doesn't cause more respiratory depression or mortality. Okay, so, so like we were saying, uh, we do remember to prescribe breakthrough doses. Uh, so if your starting dose is 2.5 milligrams, 6 to 8 hourly, then your breakthrough dose can be 2.5 milligrams, 6 hourly PRN as needed. Okay, For other opioids um, like fentanyl, and oxycodone. Uh, fentanyl has some evidence for the subcutaneous and uh, transmucosal buccal preparations, but those again are not easily used or not easy to use in the community setting. So we sometimes do also use fentanyl patch uh, if our patients uh, really hate to take oral morphine. Um, so uh, you can switch them over to a fentanyl patch of 6 to 12 mics depending on your morphine dose. Okay, and oxycodone, uh, uh, again, uh, limited evidence. So the other thing that's always associated with dyspnea that we spoke about was anxiety. Right? When people get dyspneic, right, they don't coordinate their breathing very well. They get very tense. They feel anxious. And when you are anxious, uh, you, even worse, right, you have negative thoughts. You don't even poorer coordination of the breath. And then you contribute even more to breathlessness. So that's what we call a, a, a dyspnea anxiety cycle. So to break that Disney anxiety cycle, we do use benzodiazepines. Uh, even though the last Cochrane review in 2016 uh, didn't support, or was not for or against the use of benzos, um, but we do use it as second or third line uh, because anecdotally, we do find that it helps. So sometimes if you're worried, you can use very, very short-acting uh, benzos like alprazolam 0.25 milligrams uh, TDSPRN. Or if they have a lot of insomnia, which heart failure patients also get, then you can try lorazepam, 0.5 milligrams bedtime PRN. The next symptom that's common is pain. And uh, in heart failure patients, uh, pain is often not just cardiac related. Uh, in fact, it's, it's more often contributed by comorbidities. So in this, in this paper that they, they really looked at pre pain prevalence, you can see that majority of patients actually had non-cardiac related pain. Okay. So cardiac and non-cardiac related pain. And, and it's really because a lot of IHD patients or heart failure patients have multiple comorbidities. So they get diabetic neuropathy, they get very severe arthritis, you know, the long tong tia syndrome, right? So we, we will talk about management of cardiac pain, which is angina and non-cardiac pain. So angina can be because of coronary artery disease, right? Um, there's a blockage in the vessel, and therefore, there's not enough perfusion, right? So in this case, then you want to optimize the cardiac meds, right? Um, you can use ND anginals like GTN, ISDN, ISMN, if the BP tolerates, and cardiac rehabilitation. I'm not really sure actually whether there is community services out there that does cardiac rehab, but uh, certain community hospitals and inpatient hospitals do have. Right? And even in patients who don't really have 
coronary artery disease. So for example, some of our patients with valvular heart disease or non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, they can also get angina. Right? And it's really from different mechanisms. For example, if the if they are they call it you know, inoka, that means uh, ischemic and no obstructive coronary artery disease. So it could be because of um uh, hypertensive heart disease where the myocardium is too thick for the coronary vessels to perfuse properly, right? So they get a lot of microvascular ischemia, or it could be because of coronary vasospasm, right? Where the coronaries just go into spasm. And um, in microvascular ischemia, you may notice that some of your patients may not respond very well to nitrates. In fact, they may actually feel worse with nitrates because uh, you're diverting blood flow away from the microvasculature when you vasodilate your big coronaries. So the treatment then is to optimize medical therapy, right? like beta blockers, calcium channel blockers. So it's kind of like a trial and error thing as well. Um, and then coronary vasospasm, you, you would get this history that uh, the pig, the Angina comes super randomly, even at rest, not related to exertion. Right? There may be diurnal variation, worse at night, and could be precipitated by hyperventilation. So for coronary vasospasm, nitrates work very well. And the other drugs like calcium channel blockers, clonidine, microrandil, and beta blockers are quite contraindicated. Okay. If in patients with very, very refractory angina, Right. Um, despite optimizing GTN or because you can't give GTN because BP is low, things we do use are things like opioids because opioids also have a vasodilatory effect, uh, multidisciplinary uh, angina program, right? so rehab, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, there was a case series from SGH where they did left the late ganglion block uh, just to help with angina symptoms. Uh, and I was quite impressed because um, they, they apparently do it every few months, every two to three months, because these patients have prognosis that may run in long months to years. So I think the, the longest patient they had had repeated stellate ganglion block for like 30, 30 plus times every three or four months. Right? And other things like spinal cord stimulator, which is the diagram on the right side. So for non-cardiac pain, um, we follow the WHO pain ladder. So Paraset, NSAIDs and COX-2 inhibitors are contraindicated because they can cause a worsening fluid overload and also because often they have concomitant renal impairment, right? So opioids can be used, but again, if it's, you know, if the prognosis is maybe fairly long or unpredictable, we do try to um, avoid chronic opioid usage as well. So we do tend to use adjuvants, you know, like gabapentinoids, um, but just need to be careful that it can cause peripheral edema and postural giddiness. So management of edema, uh, for semi is something you are probably all very familiar with. Um, oftentimes, it's oral furosemide at home. Sometimes in patients who cannot tolerate orally or they are really so swollen, a lot of gut edema, furosemide is just not penetrating, then, oh, sorry, not being absorbed. Then sometimes we do use uh, the subcutaneous route, right? Either a neat bolus or continuous infusion. <clears throat> and it's one-to-one -one conversion. <clears throat> the other oral medication that we do use is bumetanide. Um, uh, why we switch it is that um, bumetanide has a higher bioavailability. It's 80% compared to frisamide. So uh, a, more of it will get absorbed by the gut. And sometimes it, it helps to overcome the gut edema partner. Yeah. And it's about 40 times more potent than frisamide. So a patient who's on 40 milligrams TDS uh, can be switched to bumetanide 1 milligram TDS, for example. But I think it's a little bit more costly than frisamide. Hmm. Depression and anxiety also very prevalent and it's important to recognize because um, studies have shown that it is it, in itself, it's a negative prognostic factor for hospitalization and death. And if you treat uh, depression uh, and your patient responds to antidepressants within the first year, you actually lower their morbidity and mortality. Right? And how depression causes increased mortality and hospitalization is that they basically have poor self-care, poor coping. They don't comply with diet, medication. They lead unhealthy lifestyle, like continue to smoke. Um, and so they gain weight. They, they get very deconditioned, social isolation. Uh, and then they keep ending up in hospital for fluid overload, etc. And then they just get more and more depressed. So you also find that based on DSM-5 criteria for 
major depressive disorder, a lot of patients have overlapping symptoms. So change in weight is impossible to tell in heart failure patients, right? Because they are always like fluctuating. They gain weight rather than lose weight because of fluid. Um, they may get insomnia from heart failure itself, right? They, they get psychomotor retardation because they are just breathless. They don't really move or they move very slowly. They're always very fatigued. So one thing that we sometimes use to diagnose depression is what we call the Endicott substitution criteria. So you substitute physical symptoms for these four uh, psycho, emotional or cognitive symptoms, right? Um, fit it into the rest of the, the, the symptoms to diagnose a major depressive disorder. Right? So depression is really something that's highly prevalent but under-recognized and under-treated. And how do we treat it, right? Uh, of course, there are non-farm measures like counseling, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, because of the cardiac interaction with a lot of antidepressants, in general, SSRIs and metazapine is usually first line. Right, so you can um, start things like citalopram or sertraline, right? although some RCTs have shown that there's no benefit over placebo, but they are the kind of the safest drugs. And uh, we don't start TCAs or SNRIs like venlafaxine, right, because of cardiovascular risk and some drug-drug interactions. Okay, so oh, 2.40. Okay, so now we talk about end-stage renal failure. I hope everyone is still with me. Um, so so um, this is something I just learned from the NKF website. Uh, it's quite scary, the numbers. So we like to be in world number one, right? We are for diabetes-induced kidney failure. We are world number four for prevalence of kidney failure in general. And we are world number seven for incidence of uh, kidney failure. That means number of new cases uh, occurring every year. Right? And, and the Straits Times also published that more people in Singapore are getting kidney failure and at a later age. So just to be sure that we all are on the same page, end-stage renal failure is in general uh, not really defined by the EGFR per se. Right, is simply the point where your kidneys cannot function anymore and you require renal replacement therapy. Right? And in general, that means that um, usually your patients are hitting like CKD stage 5. Right? But I'm sure you all have also seen you know, elderly patients who are walking around with uh, EGFR of 10 and for 1-2 years and they, they are perfectly fine. They're not uremic, they're not fluid overloaded. So just something about dialysis, there's been more and more studies coming out talking about dialysis initiation in the very elderly and frail population. That's what we're going to focus on. Um, in general, right, uh, there are certain patient populations that do poorly on dialysis. right? And we'll talk about dialysis because um, I, I think you may encounter family members or patients who ask you, right, you know, should I or should I not? So elderly, right? Patients with multiple comorbidities, especially ischemic heart disease, right? Um, patients with very poor functional status and very poor nutritional status do especially poorly on dialysis. And we'll look at some of the evidence, right? So number one, does, does dialysis prolong survival in the frail elderly? The studies are actually mixed, right? So there are some studies that do show that it confers survival benefit, <clears throat> Right. although less than the, the younger population, but they do, do still have survival benefit. And the survival benefit ranges from a few months to up to like two, two three years. Right? And the moment they have multiple comorbidities or ischemic heart disease, that survival benefit is gone. Right? So there's no difference then between dialysis and conservative management if they have IHD or multiple comorbids. Right? And what the other study also showed was that Yes, they live longer, right? So the, the bar on the bottom are patients who undergo hemodialysis. And what is on the top is the MCM means maximum conservative management, right? Just to make it sound very good, right? So um, patients at the bottom bar on hemodialysis do live longer, right? But if you look at how much time they spend and where they spend that time, um, the dotted grey is uh, outpatient hemodialysis days, right? And the the darkest grey is hospitalisation days, right? So they do live maybe two years longer, but actually most of that time spent is in dialysis or in hospital, right? So there's actually very little um, uh, time that is hospital free, right? And then there are some papers, oh, sorry, and, and sorry, just to add also, because of this, um, patients who are on hemodialysis, elderly, frail, also tend to end up dying in hospital more. 
compared to patients who are conservatively managed, right? And if you look at, um, uh, yeah, so, so this paper really also shows that um, uh, if you look at the general population, right? So the, the dark line are patients who are on dialysis, right? The, the light gray one is um, conservative management. <clears throat> so if you look at this paper, um, where, where they looked at patients who did conservative versus dialysis, uh, overall, there is a survival benefit, right? And if they, they separate it into less than 80 years old, the survival benefit was very wide, very, very obvious, right? If you did dialysis, you lived much longer. But then if they looked at patients who were more than 80 years old, then the survival benefit really reduced significantly, right? And, and there's not that much difference between the black line and the grey line. So in general, um, I mean, the conclusion to that would really be that when your patients are reaching 75 years and above, um, studies differ as to whether there is actual, actual survival benefit. And even if there is, of up to two years, um, most of the time actually is end up spending in dialysis center or hospital. The second thing is patients with multiple comorbids, which a lot of our frail elderly also have. So in studies where they looked at what comorbidities worsened prognostication with dialysis the most, uh, diabetes, right? So if you have no diabetes, which is the darkest line on the left side versus um, the moment you have diabetes, whether it's the dashed line or the gray line, right? Um, the difference between them is just whether diabetes is the main cause of your renal failure. It didn't matter. If you have diabetes, your survival reduced significantly, right? And if you have um, Chalson comorbidity index, modified Chalson comorbidity index, which is MCCI um, of more than five, right? Regardless of whether you are hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis, your survival benefit also drops significantly. Okay, so high comorbidity burden is one of them. Um, the difference between the hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis, in case you are wondering, um, some studies try to study, right? Is do patients survive better with PD or HD? Um, I think at the end of the day, uh, there was no significant difference. Uh, in the initial stages, PD patients tend to do better. Um, but after a while, actually, then there was no difference. And I think the, the difference in the survival that you are seeing here is really just patient selection. Uh, right? That, um, you know, probably PD patients are also those who are a bit more sick and cannot tolerate the hemodynamic changes with HD in the first place. Okay, so again... Um, in this graph on the right side, what you are seeing is um, um, patients with um, IHD and no IHD. <clears throat> so the black line are patients who have IHD and undergo dialysis. The gray line is conservative management. So you can see some, some survival benefit between dialysis and conservative patient. But if you just focus on the black line itself, right, you notice that if you have no IHD, right, your survival uh, Right, your days after your EGFR falls below 15 mils, right? So at a thousand days, if you had no IHD, um, if you chose to be on dialysis, 80% of the chance, there's 80% chance you'll be alive by a thousand days. But if you had IHD, by a thousand days, there's only 50% chance that you will be alive, even if you chose dialysis. So the survival benefit really dropped, right? And IHD is really one significant factor. The third thing you may hear some of your family members or patients say is that, ah, dialyze, dialyze, then she will feel more alert, she can do more things, uh, she can function better, go out in the community. Um, is that really true? Actually, um, not really. Lah. Yeah. So, so this study looked at, you know, um, whether dialysis really improved symptoms or quality of life. The white bar is no dialysis, uh, gray bar is dialysis. And uh, uh, essentially, you, you see that there's not that much difference. So in terms of mobility, um, uh, not much difference, right? So people who have, uh, to begin with, people who have no problems with mobility um, and then moderate uh, disability in terms of mobility and then severe, right? Same thing with self-care, usual activity, pain and anxiety, depression. So there was really, it didn't make a difference to improving symptoms or quality of life. Okay, um, and in fact, they do find that. Uh, I don't know where my where my slide went. Oh, okay, never mind. So, so um, I, I had one slide. Maybe it's at the back. I can't remember. But um, essentially, they also found that um, 
dialysis at best at best maintains your function. It does not improve your function. And when they looked at nursing home population or residential population in the West, where they initiated on dialysis, actually most patients, you know, sometimes up to 40% or 50% of patients had a decline in function within the first six months of starting dialysis. Okay, either as a result of um, the dialysis or other comorbidities, but they basically just didn't do well. And so it's not really true also when families tell you that, you know, if they start dialysis, then they can maybe go back to walking or functioning better. So, so in, con in summary, pertaining to dialysis in general, elderly, multiple comorbidities, especially IHD, uh, poor functional status, right? poor nutritional status, these patients are really very poor candidates for dialysis. And I, I would actually really tell the family, frankly, that you may not uh, expect to see what you expect to see. I mean, you may not see what you really expect to see when you send your loved one for dialysis. Right? And so what's the other side of the coin, right? If they choose maximal conservative management, no dialysis, what do we expect? So without dialysis, um, even in the end stage, right, CKD5 or beyond, um, they can still live you know, up to one, two years, sometimes even more um, without dialysis. Right? And what we are seeing is that function itself is a very strong predictor of prognosis. Right? Um, it, they tend to somehow follow the cancer population type of trajectory where they remain quite stable. And then near the last two to three months of life, once you notice that the function starts to drop, that's, an, that's a that's a sign to tell you that you know that the, the decline is starting and it's really time to start preparing the family that you know that they are likely going to go downhill from here. Okay. And similarly, the symptom burden also tends to rise in the last two to three months of life. Right. Um, yeah. And again, uh, same as heart failure, the symptom burden is comparable to patients with advanced cancer. In fact, even patients on dialysis also have very, very high symptom burden. Okay, so um, yeah, so 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 um, dialysis or no dialysis, I, I hope now everyone has better understanding of how to advise your patients and what to look out for to make to try to guide them to a decision. Um, in twenty ten, the the RPA we know Physician Association also came up with a guideline. If you're interested, you can go and read about it. But in general, they do concur that it is reasonable to consider not starting dialysis. You know, if your patient. Um, has a terminal illness, second point. If your patient is elderly more than 75 years old, who has two or more of the following poor prognostic criteria, right? So number one, I won't be surprised the patient passed away in the next one year. Very high comorbidity score, right? Significantly impact functional status, right? So they're more chair-bound to bed-bound um, if they're very malnutritioned. Right? And of course, now we know IHD, right? One of the poor markers. Okay, and how do you talk to your elderly patients? You need to tell them that dialysis may not necessarily confer you a survival advantage, right? And sometimes you actually may live longer if you don't dialyze, right? Because you dialyze, you, you end up with complication, you may actually pass away sooner. And, and um, you, if you don't really require the dialysis at that point in time, you, you let it be, then you may die of something else really other than the renal failure actually, right? And uh, life on dialysis may detract from quality of life, right? You may not experience functional improvement. In fact, you may experience functional decline after the first year of starting dialysis, right? And there may be significant symptom burden even on dialysis. Okay? And then you may experience medicalization of death where most people end up dying in hospital, uh, etc. Okay? So in patients who have withdrawal of dialysis, I'm not sure if you see them frequently at home. I think oftentimes it's carried out in the hospital, but suffice to say that they do have very significant symptom burden, um, you know, uh, and, and they're not uh, really pain-free or, or, or what, you know, so they do have breathlessness, pain, myoclonus. And in a patient who, if you do receive a patient coming back from the hospital who is on post-withdrawal of dialysis, um, the average prognosis is about eight days if they have completely uh, end urine. That means not passing urine. Median survival is eight days. Okay. So again, symptom management in end-stage renal disease, whether they're on dialysis or not, um, fatigue, pruritus, you know, these are common symptoms, uh, constipation, anorexia. So I'll try to talk a bit about the symptoms here. Uh, some of the symptoms overlap with heart failure, so I won't repeat. I'll just focus on those that I haven't spoken about. 
So fatigue, of course, multiple, multiple factors. Uh, that can be physical, physiological factors, psychological, anxiety, stress, depression, social demographics, um, uh, family-related social caregivers, or even dialysis-related factors, right, which you can read in this diagram. So treatment of fatigue really is to try and screen and treat reversible causes, you know, like hypothyroidism, depression, insomnia. Try to manage anemia by titration of uh, your EPOS uh, and iron supplementation. Uh, I was trying to find what is the latest guidelines, so I'm not very updated because usually the renal physicians manage this, but um, I think the latest I could find uh, the KDGO and uh, KDOKI guidelines. Uh, generally, target HB is about 12 to 13. Uh, I'll be happy for anyone in the audience to correct me because I, I suspect you all will probably know this better than me. Um, and uh, the next symptom really is pruritus, right? Pruritus can be very, very irritating and very, very disabling to our patients because they cannot sleep. They are scratching all the time and then makes them very irritable, right? And in fact, pruritus is more common on, in patients on dialysis than patients who are not being dialyzed, okay? And um, the, the name is a misnomer. Like it's not really entirely because of urea itself. The mechanism is not very well understood. Some people suspect it's related to phosphate and parathyroid levels, right? And et cetera, et cetera, many other factors. Okay, so how do we treat? Sorry, the words are a bit small. Um, yeah, so treatment strategy, um, uh, non-pharmacological, uh, we tend to use oat-based emollients. So there is this uh, uh, oat-based emollient called dermabin that we sometimes recommend. Uh, nowadays, we also recommend Subam. Uh, which is uh, produced by National Skin Center, but it is costly. These emollients, a uh, small bottle is like 20 plus dollars. Um, and some of our patients don't like Subam because they say it's very cold, the menthol, right? Um, you'd want to discontinue drugs that can worsen pruritus, control your calcium and phosphate levels. Uh, UV, th UV therapy is a bit difficult for homebound patients. Like. Antihistamines, essentially, the evidence is very poor. Um, people don't believe that it really works. Like. They think it's just because uh, patients get sedated and then they stop scratching. Now, gabapentin and pregabalin, we use it quite a lot for pruritus. So in renal patients, uh, in general, we start at about 100, especially if they're frail and elderly, three times a week. Uh, you can give it post-hemodialysis. You can even do it every day, right? But you, we do it post-dialysis because it gets washed out by dialysis. Okay. Um, and now furafine, which I think it's uh, quite rare, so I won't really talk about it. Um, more systemic therapies, uh, sometimes when we are really desperate, right, they're scratching despite GABA, we do try things like metazapine, cetraline, or peroxetine, uh, but these uh, are mostly case reports, lah, right? So metazapine, uh, up to 15 milligrams, right? Oh, I don't know why this is like that. Uh, okay, never mind. Yeah, so, so this is basically the, uh, the, the workflow right? Um, basically, uh, you assess how severe the, the pruritus is. You assess whether the dialysis is sufficient, right? Um, uh, and and uh, this one usually leave it to the renal physician and the renal center. And meanwhile, you also start moisturizers, right? Gabapentin. Uh, phototherapy a bit difficult for homebound patients, right? Uh, now, furafine, which I don't really see it being prescribed as well. And if it's persisting, then you have to go for more high-level things, lah, which I, I think even in hospital, we don't do it very often because these drugs have a lot of side effects as well. So pain, again, um, multifactorial usually as a result of multiple comorbidities like diabetes, ischemic heart disease, uh, peripheral vascular disease, um, from the renal kidneys itself, like calciphylaxis, renal osteodystrophy, etc. And special consideration is that um, a lot of patients require, a lot of drugs require renal clearance, needs to be dose adjusted. Dialysis will also affect washout of the drugs. So within opioids in general, we tend to prefer drugs like fentanyl, methadone, which uh, I think in a home setting you don't really use, but uh, fentanyl would be our go-to. Um, you can use morphine, but you just need to be very, very cautious, lower the dose and lower the frequency. Um, Gabapentin, doses up to 300 a day. A pregabaline up to 100 a day is generally safe. Use with caution drugs like tramadol, oxycodone, nortriptyline, and uh, do avoid uh, uh, other drugs like uh, codeine, mepiridine. Uh, morphine, very, very careful. Lah. If you can, you try to use fentanyl patch. Okay, so others, um, 
you know, they may have things like nausea vomiting. And because nausea vomiting tends to be a more central cause, not really a GI cause, so we tend to opt for drugs that have more central dopamine action like haloperidol. Um, if they have very severe myoclonus, then we go for benzodiazepines. Right? If they have restless leg, then sometimes um, gabapentin or levodopa, etc. So the, the, the very last two slides that I have really is um, uh, the importance of, I, I think I focus a lot on the medical part, um, but really psychosocial care is also a huge part in end organ failure. And unfortunately, we may not have time to talk about it today. But I think advanced care planning is really and very, very important for end organ patients. Um, I, I do find that a lot of them are progressing actually into advanced stages and they're still very blur about it, right? They just go in and out of hospital, not really knowing that actually this is a life-limiting condition right? because they've survived the hospitalization so many times, right? And, and then when, it, when the, when the, when the um, severity of it really hits them, uh, they are very stunned, right? So there's no goals of care discussion. They end up in ICU and uh, everything just spirals downwards from there. Lah. Okay, so sometimes in, in talking about goals of care and advanced care planning, one strategy I use in um, end organ failure is because prognostication is so hard, I actually use a best case scenario and a worst case scenario. So I'll tell them that, you know, in the best case scenario, you remain stable for the next few months, uh, maybe one, two years at best. Um, you may not get hospitalized very much. You know, that's the best case scenario. But in the worst case scenario, this is what might happen. And then you talk to them about hospitalization, ICU, you know, functional decline, uh, things like that. And, and patients are generally a bit more receptive to that than us trying to tell them how many more months you have to live because we don't even know it ourselves sometimes. Yeah, so I've come to the end. Um, okay, I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you so much, Chia Hui. That's yeah. a delightful and enlightening lecture. Lots of information. It's excellent. Thank you so much. Are there any questions uh, from the floor? Uh, there's a question. Um, are there any benefit or adverse effects of arbitrary treatment of depression in end-stage heart failure? Yeah, Dr. Ao. Yeah, so, so I think this probably came from the, the challenge that diagnosing depression is so difficult, right? Because there are so many physical symptoms that overlap. Um, in general, I'm somebody who tends to go for uh, a benefit of the doubt. That means if I think there is underlying depression, I would actually prefer to treat, right? And in general, SSRIs um, and metazapine is quite safe. Um, so I would really start the antidepressants um, to, of course, together with psycho-emotional support, multi-D support from my social workers and um, uh, counsellors, and then really just monitor closely for uh, adverse effects. Lah, right? Yeah. So, so I, I usually prefer to treat because the, I, I find that not treating and leaving them as they are um, just doesn't help them and doesn't help the caregivers. Yeah. So to me, it's try off nothing. Lah. Yeah. Thanks, Chia Hui. Any other one with questions? Yes. Uh, most of the data on dialysis is HD or P, uh, PD. Are there, is, uh, uh, um, or there is no difference? Uh, I think most of the data is HD. Uh, most of the papers that I've quoted is hemodialysis. But people have looked at comparing hemo versus peritoneal. And um, yeah, like I was saying just now, I think um, they do show that in the initial phase, uh, PD patients tend to do better. Um, so, I mean, probably because it's a bit gentler, um, and uh, but then uh, after a while, actually, there's no difference in terms of survival or mortality. Yeah. Thanks. Somebody, uh, somebody starts talking. Uh, there's a question related to policies about uh, palliative care funding, but I wonder whether can we scope the questions related to today's topic first. Um, Dr. Chan, you hold on for a while. Are there any other questions related to heart failure and kidney failure palliation? Um, I have one question. Um, uh, Chahui, you mentioned about uremic sim symptoms. How frequently is it do you get uremic encephalopathy with uh, maybe seizures? And how do you manage it? Mm. Yeah, so I think about... Um, uh, we, we do see it on and off. Uh, if I remember the stats correctly, it's about 10% of patients 
uh, do get uremic seizures. 10% of patients with severe uremia do get seizures. Um, in, in general, I mean, and most of these, of course, are patients who are conservatively managed, lah, not for dialysis. Um, in general, we use benzos uh, to, to manage. Uh, most of the time also because by the time they develop uremic seizures, they are really more in the terminal phases. Um, so, so we don't, there's, there's very little evidence for things like anti-epileptics, right? Things like your traditional phenytoin, Capra, uh, not so much for the non-neuro, uh, non-CNS pathology uh, type. So we tend to use benzos and then we keep them on until the end in general. Mm. So it's um, oral, if there's NG tube, if there's no NG tube, we'll use uh, parectal or how, how do we advise uh. family? Yeah. Okay. So so usually uh, in the home hospice setting, we do usually use subcutaneous. If, if they if it's really like uremic seizures, then we may actually use subcutaneous initially. Um. So we may run midazolam infusion. Uh. Like five milligrams. Uh, I mean, it depends on the type of uh, strange pump that you use at home. But we can go up to five milligrams in a day or ten milligrams in a day, and then we run it uh, via different types of pumps. Like every home care service has a different type. Mm. Um, oral may be a bit more difficult uh, for seizure control at the beginning, unless you already have a dose with your subcutaneous. Uh, but we do sometimes also use clonazepam. So let's say they've been on midas for a while and they look like they are stabilizing, then we sometimes switch them to uh, long acting uh, benzos like clonaz. Yeah. Uh, BD dosing, yeah. Mm. If we don't have strange driver, how do you manage? <laughs> uh, if don't have strange driver, uh, I think at home would be quite difficult, like uremic seizure. Then mm -hmm. then usually for these patients, um, I, I may in fact ask the family if they're open to transiting to inpatient hospice um, because I, I think having the family witness seizure at home uh, and, and dosing orally via ng tube may be quite distressing uh, yeah. uh, because it'd be very, very slow. Mm. So have you um, experienced with stay solid, you know, rectal diazepam? Yes, we have, yeah. So, so we do give PR diazepam 10 milligrams. I mean, if you give and it aborts the seizure, then, then that's good law. Then you just yes. pray very hard that it doesn't come back. But the problem is that sometimes it's quite refractory. Then that's when we really need to set up pumps. Yeah. Yes. Hmm. So there's a question from Dr. Chan about the um, management of gross edema at the end stages. What can be done? Gross edema. Oh yeah, that's a. Oh, I'll be very frank with you. That it's a very very difficult symptom. Um, a lot of our patients are very distressed. I mean, uh, we try non-farm measures. You know, simple things like elevation, elevating the legs, um, diuretics. Uh, but I, I would be very frank that it's, it's really very difficult. A lot of times they are, they are diuresed until they are like intravascularly depleted and they are hypotensive, but the leg is still very very swollen. Um. Uh. Ever once before, uh, I, I, I worked with a consultant who tried, um, what do you call that? Uh, I can't remember the name suddenly. Uh, basically, she put in a subcut needle and tried to draw fluid out. Uh, it wasn't, it wasn't that there is some evidence in the literature, case studies, but I think it's very hard to do in the home setting. And uh, uh, um, evidence is really not very strong. And there's always a risk of introducing infection when you start poking a very swollen leg. Yeah, so, so it would really be non-farm, like elevating fluid restriction and diuretics still. Mm. Either that or just um, counsel the family that it is, the edema is yeah. gross, but it's harmless. Huh? So yeah. there's a question related to bermetonite and metalazone as diure um, diuretic treatment. What are, how do you use them and uh, how do you choose among the two? Um, what kind of doses will you use? Seeding doses? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So so um yeah, so uh uh I generally uh, may try adding metolazone first simply because it has a it works on a different part of the of the of the loop of Henley, right, compared to um frisamide. So um uh uh I may add metolazone like 2.5 milligrams uh, once a day or even up to twice a day. Um, and then escalate to, I, I mean, a bit, I'm a bit like more kitschy because at the same time, you don't really know what's the electrolytes and things like that like. So um, I may go up to five at most. Um, and uh, if, if they don't work, then sometimes I do switch from frosamide to bimetanide as well. Yeah. Thanks, Jiahui. There's a question from Dr. Ku. Is there a particular point at the end of life where feeding is stopped, whether through NG tube or otherwise? as there is uh, too much respiratory distress? And if so, how do we decide when do we stop feeding? Yeah, so um, I, I presume this can be both in the setting of heart failure and renal failure. Um, 
uh, is is that is that right? So, so um, in general, we would talk about really withholding NG feeds if the patient is really in the last days to short weeks. Uh, usually last days lah, and uh, um, uh. Especially if they are very overloaded already, they have a lot of respiratory secretion uh, and they are very breathless, then we really counsel the family that at this point, uh, hydration and nutrition, artificial hydration and nutrition does not really prolong survival um, and that may worsen the patient's distress and symptoms. Um, most of the family members are generally accepting if they know that this is the terminal phase. Of course, there are some families that really, really feel very strongly that you cannot just stop feeding. And then in these patients, we really give um, maybe like 10 meals or 20 meals four times a day of water, um, just also for, for the, to cushion the impact on the family that, you know, we are still trying to give a little bit of fluid. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Thanks, Chia Hui. So we have no more questions on the chat, but there's a question from Dr. Chan. It's related, but not so directly related, related to subsidies for palliative care. Mm -hmm. um, when does government subsidy come in? How many months available? Difficulty prognosticating variable survival for end organs. So um, Chia Hui, do you have any answers to this question on non-cancer end-of-life subsidy? Mm, yeah, so, so um, that is one of the pain points currently because I, I also am very passionate about end organ failure care and I think our unfortunately our system have not caught up yet we are still in the prognosis based model which means that patients get three months subsidy for inpatient hospice and uh, up to one year subsidy for home hospice services um, which is why um, you know it's taken us quite a bit of struggle to also get our home hospice services to, to start accepting this end organ failure patients um, I, I don't know I, I think People more senior than me up there are trying to change things. Uh, I think we do recognize the need of these end organ failure patients, but unfortunately, at this point in time, it's really still time and prognosis based. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Chia Hui. So, uh, with that, we can end the session and we are slightly overrun. So, thanks for the very rich. Um, talk and uh, uh, well, I'm just a reminder for those of you who like to, the notes huh, you can actually go to our YouTube channel with Home Nursing Foundation this will be um, posted there soon and then you can you can listen to it you know and then get yourself um, some revision again and when you really come across a case you can refer to this I think it's very very useful today thanks so much Yahui. so maybe um, uh, we have some message from our uh, from Shireen Shireen would you like to talk about this Oh, would you like me to share? <laughs> anyway, this is a QR code. If you could uh, help us by giving us some feedback. Or oh, Shireen, could you cut and post the, the link? Uh, YouTube channel, okay. Um, post, um, Shireen, if you could post this feedback form also on the chat. And anyone, everyone can also use the QR code to give us some feedback. The, um, all this feedback helps us to improve on the program. And um, yeah, while we are doing that, uh, to answer Dr. Chan's question about YouTube channel, um, in our poster for today's uh, talk, there are two QR codes. The one at the top is for you to register. The one at the right lower corner is the link to your YouTube channel. Um, what is posted there is last month's talk by Dr. Lee Chung Singh. So you can actually go to the YouTube channel to listen last month's talk. And soon we'll post today's talk onto the same channel and you can revise on, on today's uh, talk. Yeah, so um, Shireen, our nurse manager, has just posted the link to the feedback. So please give us a feedback to, to improve on our program. Um, yeah, so with that, uh, we have come to an end. But Priscilla and Shireen, do you have any other instructions? Um, Priscilla. Uh, at the moment, um, we will share the link for the YouTube videos and recordings to all the past teachings. Ah. Um, so say, stay tuned for it. Okay. So with that, uh, we thank you very much. And thanks, Chia Hui, for the research, the presentation, and sharing of your knowledge. And um, so glad to have you sharing with us today. Okay. Um, yeah. So, thank you. Thank you. Christine? Yeah, okay. Yes. Okay. Um, um I think the the session has ended. Please uh feel free to stay on if you do want to uh have any further follow-up questions or chat. And also um 
uh, if you're interested in home care and uh, you would like to take care of patients uh, by visiting them at home, you can also contact us. We can uh, try to link you up and, and um, be able to uh, provide you with the support to do home care um, for many of the subsidized patients that, that are under Home Nursing Foundation. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention and attendance. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.